Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. An important question to ask yourself is, do I know what those desires of my heart are? And the answer is, you do not. God alone knows the desires of your heart, and God alone will fulfill those desires if you delight yourself in the Lord. What is it that you delight in most on a daily basis? Is it your iPhone? Is it a television show? Is it an experience? Is it a certain food? Is it a certain relationship? Is it a certain habit or hobby or sport? What is it that you delight on on a daily basis? One of the best examples we can talk about this morning that gave one of the greatest example in church and missions history about a man who had a heart after the Lord, who delighted in the Lord, was this man, David Brainerd. He was one of the greatest men that God used to call thousands, and this is historically reported, thousands of young men and women into missions because of this one young man. He was born in the year 1718. He attended Yale University. Before he did, he received Christ at age 21 and felt called to be a pastor. And so he went to Yale Divinity School, which was about a six-year process. And he was at the top of his class and was kicked out of his class because he said something that I can picture myself saying, (laughs) that his professor, that a chair had more grace than his professor did. And at that time, there was a great awakening happening in the colonies. There was great revival. And the older, more staunch religious men that did not have a heart after God tried to crush those revival times. And they saw students like David Brainerd as a threat to their own lack of delight in the Lord. And they kicked him out of school. And repeatedly, he tried to get back in, and they refused his entrance. And even during that time, He, at one point, before he got kicked out, had to leave school for many weeks because he was so sick, coughing up blood. His exact disease was not, of course, diagnosed, but could have been tuberculosis or a myriad of other ailments that affected his lungs. But he suffered a great deal physically to the point where he wanted God to take his life. He spent four years in preparation And God calling him to the mission field to reach the Indians, the Native Americans, in the Northeast. He was saved and prepared for four years and spent four years as a missionary and died at the age of 29. He spent much of his ministry in depression, in great discouragement, in agony in his heart to be with Jesus Christ. What we talked about last week. David Brainerd is a perfect example of the groanings of the heart. And I pray that that message last week didn't go over your heads. And if you don't groan over the things of sin in your own heart and sin that's happening in the world, the disgrace and dishonor and the shame and the perversions that are happening in the world around us, then maybe you don't even have the Holy Spirit inside you because the Holy Spirit will groan when so many things are taking place in our world that grieve the Spirit of God. David Brainerd understood the groanings of his heart. David Brainerd, in the end, if we looked at all Christian, quote-unquote, Christian books today about how to be successful in ministry, you look at David Brainerd's life and no one would write a book about him. None of the principles that you see in church growth books and successful ministry, how-to books, would ever follow the principles that David Brainerd lived in his life. His ministry was one of deep prayer, groanings of the heart, fasting and suffering through depression and many times saying, Lord, please take my life. I can't take this world. I can't take this loneliness. I can't take this physical suffering anymore. Please take my life. In terms of ministry, those four years were amazing time and he would never see it until heaven At the most, a couple hundred Native Americans came to Christ. But at the most. But what David Brainerd did not know is that the famous Jonathan Edwards was going to take all of his diary, 
all of his journal, convert it into a book, The Life and Writings of David Brainerd. And that book, God would use to teach young men and women how to delight in the Lord and desire Jesus more than anything else on this earth. And that one desire, that passion, that, that suffering that all these men and women saw when they read his journal entries is what God used them to respond to the call to preach the gospel around the world. Amen. This book was especially used in the 1930s, 40s, 50s when the, one of the greatest revival movements happened around the world. So much was this man, young man, who died 29 but so passionate about knowing the Lord Jesus, having that one desire, even the father of modern missionaries, William Carey, received his calling and his passion to reach India for Christ because of David Brainerd. The cycle, the, the, the domino effect of, of David Brainerd's life was nonetheless amazing of how many young Godly men and women he influenced and infected by his sufferings and his afflictions that he wrote and recorded with great detail. He had an ability by the Holy Spirit to write the groanings of his heart in a special way that you and I many times have a very difficult time to articulate. Like King David, David Brainerd had that ability. I wonder, and I've thought this before, not just because of this message, how many hundreds and hundreds of people have come to Christ in Nicaragua because of David Brainerd? Because that was one of the principal books God used in my life to prepare me for the mission field. Jonathan Edwards, David Brainerd, Hudson Taylor, and a fourth book called Bruchko, who most of you have probably heard about or read. David Brainerd took my heart, took my soul, my heart to levels where my soul needed to go. And God richly blessed my preparation for the mission field because of Brainerd. He yearned to know Christ and to make Christ known. He had one simple mission in life. But if you look at his four years of ministry, spending much of that time alone in the woods, fasting and praying, you would see his life thinking, well, of all the famous people in the past 50 years in evangelical America, he would never even rank even close to any of the ones we read about or look at the, at the internet or on web pages or on conferences. David Brainerd would never be at those conferences. He would never be invited to be the main speaker at an event of 5,000 people. He spent most of his ministry alone in the woods. When he wasn't evangelizing the Indians, he was crying out to the Lord for rescue out of his depression and his discouragement. Even on his birthday, he would spend his birthdays fasting and in prayer. So David Brainerd died at 29 at the house of Jonathan Edwards and his Jonathan Edwards' daughter obviously loved him deeply and they wanted to marry and that never happened. But David Brainerd obviously died thinking I failed the Lord. What did I accomplish in this life? He was, and at times, in excruciating physical pain. That even when he'd ride his horse, he'd say, all that would came out of my body was me coughing blood up everywhere. And yet, Dick Brainerd made a choice to desire one was to delight in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what satisfied the depths of his soul. And it doesn't matter if you're not called to ministry, full-time ministry or not. For every believer in Jesus Christ, that is our calling. Amen? Amen. We read through the Psalms and think, wow, David's passion and love for, for the Lord and for God's blessing on his life. And for God's presence in his life. And what has happened in the American church today is that people delight in God's blessing and God's gifts. But they do not delight in God himself. And I'm here to tell you, if you delight in the things of God and even the Bible. And going to church and worshiping and 
Being a part of ministries, and you delight in all that. It makes you feel good. If that is the end of your delight, you will for surely be an empty person who is never satisfied. Because everything goes back to the longings of our heart to delight in that which is most beautiful, most perfect, most sublime, most amazing, most stunning, most gorgeous and magnificent and awesome. God is the most perfect ideal of what beauty really is. God creates beautiful things in creation. God creates beautiful people to show how beautiful He is. So if you see that beautiful sunset at the beach, if you see a a whale breaching out of the water in the middle of the ocean, all of that is to show you that God is the source of all beauty. So many times, and I've seen this so prevalent, that people worship this book and delight in this book without delighting in its author. And how shameful that is. That's called counterfeit religion, amen? They treat the Bible as a fetish. They don't love and delight in God. They love what God does for them. They love how the Bible makes them feel smarter and more wise than everyone else around them. They delight in their own pride and their own arrogancy. But they do not delight in God. So what is the biblical principle? It's, it's simply this. Guidance for all of life. Make God your heart's des- delight. Then you shall have your heart's desire. Here's the amazing thing. God never, ever allows it to work the other way around. This is the American church. Put your heart and your delight in yourself. And then eventually you'll end up loving God. That's the lie that the church teaches in general. A lie that has infiltrated the souls of man, of people attending church every single Sunday for 30, 40, 50 years. Do you this morning, right here and right now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or stand up. Can you honestly say, I don't want you shaking your heads, nothing. But in the quietness of your heart right now, can you honestly say, I delight in God more than anything else on this earth. I want to know Jesus. And I must warn you, because everything in scripture, everything in biblical teaching should be front loaded. The more you pray to know Christ, the more you will spend in affliction. You cannot know and delight in Christ if you are attached to the things of this earth. So God uses affliction to pull the roots and pull all of those desires and those fleshly inclinations that you and I have to go to the ways of the world and enjoy what the world says you must have. And God uses affliction to pull us away and to put our eyes only on Christ. And so many times in our Christian life, we are praying for God's blessing We are praying for God to give us this, that, and the other. And we are going through sufferings that we want God to remove, not now, but yesterday. And God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. And so that continues on in our life. And God is giving us such greater gifts. The gift of His Son and knowing His Son. So how many times do we want the gifts, but we don't want the giver? How many things that God gives because He is such a good, loving Father. He gives us so many good gifts and it's not enough for us. It's simply not enough. And those gifts will never be enough. We must have the giver Himself. I am 40, I guess 44 right now. July changed that. I was going to say 43. I was like, I can't lie. And I've ran into very few people that actually love Jesus. I've I ran into a lot of very smart academic theologians, a lot of professors, a lot of pastors. And none of those people bless me. 
But whether it's a little old lady, whether it's a 19-year-old kid, whether it's a 40-year-old single mother, when they love Jesus and they delight in no one else but God, they bring a presence and a joy and a peace to my soul that nothing in this world can compare with. So would I rather have the great theologian by my side? Would I rather have the person that just got out of jail that delights only in God because he knows what a wicked, depraved sinner he actually is? So what defines Christianity for you? What defines a very godly person to you? Is it someone that has all the Bible answers, as Bible answer man? Does that, does that delight your heart? Does that please your soul? Or does that little old lady that constantly prays for Christians around the world that loves and delights in the presence of God, would you rather be with her? Because I would. I don't want to be with Bible answer man because he doesn't have all the answers. She does. David's desire, Psalm 27, 4, and it is clearly written one of the most beautiful and most famous psalms. One verse, David says, one thing, okay, can you please underline that in your Bibles, please? One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you could have that one thing as David prayed, would you be the happiest person on planet Earth? To be in God's presence continually, to gaze upon his beauty. Now I'm going to ask you a very difficult, deep theological question. Is that a selfish prayer? And the answer is that it is. And it is the most holy, selfish prayer you could possibly pray. Does that not please and glorify God that you would be so filled with pleasure and joy because that one thing was being answered for you? That is the Westminster Confession that I mentioned a week or so ago. That what glorifies God the most is when we enjoy and are satisfied the most in Him. Not in toys, not in other people, not in church. But when we are most satisfied with God is when he is the most glorified. This prayer, David, most glorified God. Do you delight in Jesus? You all need to know something about me and my pastoral theology, my ecclesiology, that means the theology of the church. I do believe that every member of this church should be a true missionary of Jesus Christ. Not in the traditional apostolic sense of the word because you're not all going to go cross-culturally to preach Jesus. But to have that heart to be a servant of Jesus knowing that this world is not your home. And that I do believe if you're truly saved that you need to love and delight in Jesus more than anything else in this world. I can't do that for you. No one can do that for you. Only the Lord through the Holy Spirit can do that for you. And if God gives you that gift of, of delighting and beholding the giver more than any gifts, then that truly is the greatest gift outside of salvation that God can give you. David says, and you all know this psalm as well, Psalm 84.10, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand I would rather stand in the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So we could talk about God's holiness all day long. And you could, I could preach in such a way that all of you would feel like total worthless scumbags like worms and that you are so guilty and yet that would still not change your heart or the holiness in your life. Because why would you want to be holy unless you love the one who is the source of holiness? Why would you care about living unstained, 
separate, called out, which is the, the, what church means, the assembly called out from the world, why would you even care about being careful what you watch on TV or what you look at on your phone or how you maintain your physical body sexually? Why would you even care that God is holy and completely separate from anything that is not perfect? Why would you even call, care to be holy? If I say if you're not holy, you're going to go to hell. Well, you're going to be holy just because out of fear and being scared to death. But that will never produce true holiness. That just produces religion and a false godliness. But if you delight alone in Jesus, and you know that God walked in perfect holiness all the days of his life on earth, you will want to be holy because he is holy, because you love him, because you know he first loved you. To be holy just to be holy has no power in it, does it? But to be holy because God is the one doing that work in you because your eyes are fixed on Him. He is the one that makes you holy. It's not you that does it. So as you are delighting in God, God through His Spirit makes you holy. He takes away those evil, sinful desires and gives you His desires. Amen? And and you can't do that on your own. It, It is a supernatural work of God to put that heart in you like he did to David Brainerd. But once again, this church is going to talk about what is truly successful Christian living versus what we hear all in evangelical culture. Simply the two don't go together. What the church today calls a failure, God calls a success. And so these are the successful men who... Humanly speaking, he did not have a successful ministry. Not just David Brainerd. If we look at what the church today views as successful living, did Jesus Christ himself have a successful life? Did Jesus Christ himself have a successful ministry? He had 12 teenagers at the end, minus one. Wow, Jesus, at the end of your ministry, you should have had 10, 20, 100, probably a couple million because you're the son of God. But you lost one. And and you only had 11. See, even this church, meeting in a garage, a really comfortable garage, there's no oil stains anywhere that I know of. And yet we're part of literally 10 church plants. What's your definition of success? Do we want a big building where it can house 3,000 people? Or do we want to know that people in many different countries and regions are coming to Christ? What do you want? Do you want to feel good about how successful your pastor and your church is and all the ministries and programs? Is that what you want? Or do you want to delight in Jesus? I this is gonna sound strange and and even critical to you, but but it is nonetheless theologically accurate. I don't care so much what happens to this church. I care what happens inside the heart of each one of you. Whether or not you love Jesus or not. If the majority of this church in five years doesn't delight in Jesus individually, you, you, you can't say after the end of five years, wow, the majority of that church individually, they love and delight in God alone. Then I would consider at the end of five years a total failure of what God has called me to do. Because I taught you how to play good, be good at church. But I didn't teach you the most important thing in this life is to delight in the beauty and the presence of God. Your iPhone can't do that for you. Your job, money, all the toys that Gallus and Valley has. Phoenix has a lot of toys growing up there. But per capita, I think Bozeman trumps that. 
There's a lot of toys here. And yet people are miserable. These are the most, some of the most beautiful homes. Architecture, design, building, and people are miserable. They think that if they make their house big enough, the most customized that they can, that will bring delight to their soul. And in their end, they're miserable. If you don't want to sell any cookies, any, any chocolate bars at all, just go to Black Bowl. They won't buy anything. It's like the poor little cute kid is trying to sell chocolate bars and these multimillionaires, no, oh, not interested. Because they're miserable people. And according to the world, they have everything. What do you want in this life and why? What were Jesus' desires? Don't you think that that's an important question to ask yourself? And, and do you know that the Bible answers that question? This is what Jesus desired. One of my favorite chapters in all the Bible is John 17. John 17, Jesus says this in verse 24, Father, I desire, there you go, right, underline that word. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that you may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, I'm not a highly person, but don't you think that that would make anyone start to shed tears? If you can't see Jesus' heart in John 17, you're not alive. We need to take you to the morgue. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me. That presence, amen. Do you realize that Jesus wants you to be with him more than you want to be with him? To be with me where I am so that they may see your glory. That's what Jesus desired. Which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Remember when I told you that the Bible is a book that is a love story from God to man? You have two options. One will lead you down a very, very bad path away from the gospel. One will lead you to Jesus. You will either view this book as an academic book or you will view it as a romantic book. Now you know which one I believe it is, don't you? Do you really believe that God wants to be studied and written a report about him that impresses all who read it? Wow, that is so theologically and exegetically accurate. It blows my mind. That's better than Calvin. Or do you want God from heaven to look down on you saying, my son, my daughter doesn't study me. He or she loves me. You have two options to take. One, go to church every Sunday and play the church game, which that's what most people do. And people will stroke your ego that you've been faithful out of all these years going to church and never missing one Sunday. That doesn't mean faithfulness at all because God sees the heart. I see the one struggling immensely like David Brainerd, like so many church fathers did. Depression, discouragement, feelings of a total failure Yet they learned through their afflictions how to love Jesus. If you don't care and delight about God, no amount of books about holiness, no amount of sermons will change the desires of your heart. Jesus desired for believers to be with him and for believers to see God's glory. That's a pretty simple prayer, isn't it? And that's a pretty simple life. So the U.S. culture teaches you the more complicated your life gets with things and stuff and money and jobs and titles and friends, the more happy you're going to be. And God teaches us that the simpler your life becomes, that Jesus becomes anything and everything, he, he is the center of your delight. 
that all things fade away. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his what? Wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. You don't look to Jesus' wonderful face. And the things of this earth will consume you. Those are the options that each one of us has been given. God could force our obedience. He has the power to do it, amen? But God never does. He gives us the option of whether or not in our free will, and though it's all under the sovereignty of God, he gives us the choice, will you love me or will you love the things of this world? I have been in the moment of sinful temptation. I mean, all temptation is sinful. But in that moment, before making a choice, I have heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and not even talk about the sin, not even talk about the temptation, not even talking about the ensuing consequences. But I've had the Holy Spirit speak to me and simply ask me, Jared, do you love me? And I knew it was the Lord. And I knew it was a question, not of the temptation or the sin or the desire in me for that, but I knew it was a question of affections of my heart. Were they towards Christ or were they towards the things of this earth? And three, what were the Apostle Paul's desire? What was his desires? Philippians 3, 8 through 11 says this, more than that, I count all things to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. So brothers and sisters in Christ, is your house, is your job, is your schooling, is your titles, are your clothes, your car, is everything a loss compared to Jesus Christ? What about your friends? What about your family? Paul says they've suffered the loss of all things, count them but rubbish, so that may gain Christ. I may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that's the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed <coughs> to his death. Remember what we talked about last week in the prayer being conformed to the image of Christ? This is it. Verse 10 is an amazing, amazing synopsis of the Christian life. It is the simplicity that each of us need, and we need that right now. Before you leave this building, may this be transformed in part if it is not what Paul is desiring at the end of his days, that I may know him, the power of the resurrection. It doesn't say academic knowledge. It doesn't say that I'm able to handle all Christian theology and doctrine. He's talking about power, amen? The fellowship of his sufferings. That doesn't sound very successful to me. Being conformed to his death, once again, that doesn't seem very appeasing, appetizing to me. But when I understand that that is the sweetest fellowship and the greatest need of my soul, I will long to have it. A deep love for Christ makes personal discipline a whole lot more feasible, enjoyable, and sustainable. Amen? I don't know if I put that or not. A deep love for Christ makes personal discipline a whole lot more feasible, enjoyable, and sustainable. <clears throat> if you don't have the affections for Christ, praying on your knees for five minutes seems like an eternity. If you love Christ, praying on your knees for 15, 30 minutes seems like the shortest time in the world. All of it has to do with the affections of your heart. How many millions and millions of dollars have we spent on youth groups and college ministries? 
the statistics, and I've read them a long time ago, about how much is invested in high school students and churches and college ministries is incredible. And yet most college students graduate from either a high school or college, these young people graduate, and none of them almost love Jesus. They go to church because they know it's a good thing to do. They were taught to do that as kids. But even though millions of dollars have been invested in them, they don't really care about Jesus. You all know the statistics. 60% leave the church or the faith by their sophomore year in college. By the time they're seniors in college, 90% walk away from God. Why? Because the pastors, leaders, parents did never te- taught their kids how to delight in God. If you look at it like this, John Piper is not the most gifted preacher and speaker, is, if you're honest. He's not very gifted. In the world, he would not be considered an eloquent speaker. He would not be invited to Harvard or Yale or Stanford. But the reason why he is so effective is because his heart yearns for Jesus. He is confessional. He has talked openly about his son's rebellion, about his marriage problems, about needing counseling. And yet what it impacts is that he has that heart of David Brainerd. He is confessional to the world because he doesn't care what everyone knows about all his faults and hidden secrets and sins. All he cares about and yearns for is to delight and Jesus and not waste his life on this earth. So if that happens to you, if God gives you that great gift, it really doesn't matter what happens to the rest of the future of this church. If that happens to each and every one of you, that's all God desires for creating and initiating this church. But yet, if this church grows and we have 1,000 people, and yet it's a church where the pastors and leaders and the members don't delight in God, then that church is an utter failure. We could send 500,000 of dollars every year to missions, have programs all over the place in the city, and yet have no eternal rewards because no one in the church truly delights in the presence and in the beauty of Jesus Christ. We love because he first loved us. If you don't love Jesus right now with all of your heart, it's because maybe you've never experienced the love of God. Because the love of God, let me clearly state it, never fails. When God sends out his love, just as he sends out his word, it will accomplish the reason and the purpose why he sent it. It will transform hearts. You cannot spend time in the presence of Christ and be the same person. It is impossible. So when we talk about prayer, we must talk about the affections, the emotions of the heart. Amen? Because if I talk about prayer to you and I tell you, that if you don't pray this, 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 and this, you're not a good Christian at all, and you feel horribly guilty, that will change you for about maybe the maximum a week. But if you learn what it means to grow and be in a love, deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, you will be praying so much during the day, during the night, during the week, that you have no idea how much you are walking in the presence of Christ because he is doing the work in you. You don't even realize what he's doing. If you realize everything that God's doing in your life, chances are it's all you, none of him. And so you must know this morning that this church is not a normal church. And this has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with learning what touches the heart of God. And that delightness in Him is the foundation of the entire human life. When you enjoy God just because you enjoy God, 
You bring a smile to God's face. You touch his heart in a way that most people never touch his heart. Delight yourself in God and he will give you the desires of your heart. Here's the amazing thing about that verse. It's rhetorical. Like God, what other desires in this world could possibly match delight in God? Could it be that you spend your life delighting in God and not do the desires of your heart and you get that trip of your dreams, you get that million dollar home or that exact car that you wanted and think, finally, my heart's desires are realized. Finally, my heart's desires are accomplished. If you truly delighted in God for your whole life, would you even want those material things? At that point, you would be so satisfied in God, you would realize, oh, God is my heart's desire. Now, it's not to say that that is separate and divorced from God's kingdom being built in missions. Many times, 15 years in Nicaragua, people think the mission field is a romantic life. And that is a lie. It is a life of a lot of hard work and suffering with very short and, and short-lived times of glory and romance. But in those brief moments, on the mission field, there are times when the glory of God is seen. And God has shown and spoke to my heart and my heart has been filled with extreme joy that I cannot put into words. God has revealed to me this is the desire of your heart to build my kingdom in this way. It was in Nicaragua, it was doing what God had called me to do, fulfilling his will for my life. Now for Tanya, as she has given testimony many times, that was in the little huts in Africa and at the schools and at the jails that filled her heart with, this, with the knowledge of the secret desires that God gave to her. And such it is with every one of you if you are truly a believer in Jesus Christ. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, you will wander all the days of your life and never be happy. And if you are truly a believer in Jesus Christ, God will send you the afflictions necessary to bring your heart wholly to Him. Not because God is some cruel ogre up in heaven, but because God knows, because He truly loves you, that all the promises of the world and sin in this temporal life will destroy your soul. And so God sends afflictions to pull your soul away from the world and bring you to his son to be like that little child. And this is the most deepest, most profound, most intelligent theology that you could ever hear. And sadly, it's what's not preached in our churches today. The best theology that you could ever believe in and live out is going up in Jesus' lap, resting your head on his chest and saying, Jesus, I love you. And to receive his sweet embrace and affirmation of you as his child, that is, is where God is guiding and leading you. If you think you're too theologically smart and godly for that, then you have missed Christianity. You have no idea what you're talking about. The greatest theological song, the deepest academic truth, is simply in the little child's song, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. You think you're too good, too mature for that song. Then you don't know Jesus. You've never spent time with God. This is God's calling for your life and my life. 
What do I want the most in life? You must ask yourself that question. I want a really happy marriage. Well, good luck at that one. Because if that woman doesn't have her delight in God, her husband will never do it. If that man doesn't have his delight in Jesus, his wife will never do it. What do I long for? What is the main reason I want money? What's the main reason I want a college degree? What job do I want the most and why? Why do I want to be a part of this church or any good church? And lastly, what am I most afraid of in life? What am I most afraid of in life? My greatest fear is failing Christ. What is your greatest fear? And chances are, the more you answer what you want the most in life with a delight in God, that will in and of itself take care of your greatest fear. So how to get rid of fear out of your life? Don't focus on the fear. Don't try to rationalize your way out of the fear that is overwhelming you at times. Put your eyes on Christ and delight wholly on Him. By way of ending... Just by reviewing the life of David Brainerd, all of these memories came back when I was 17, 18 years old, reading Brainerd. All the emotions, the heartache I saw in him, God used to change my own heart, to grow my affections for Christ because of his life. So when I look at reading historically the thousands of people that came to be full-time missionaries because of reading David Brainerd. And yet, God in His grace was putting me in that same group of people that have long since passed away. And I felt overwhelmingly grateful to be included in that group. And so for you, this is what people don't seem to understand there won't be any church in heaven. You realize that, right? There won't be any services. Every second of every day in heaven will be spent gazing upon the beauty of Jesus Christ and dwelling in his temple. And that should excite your heart, should it not? And knowing that this time of church and the church age that we're all a part of is to prepare your heart for that moment. That's the only reason why you're here at Petra Bible Church. To equip, to train you, to be prepared for that moment and to bring as many people as possible with you to gaze upon the beauty of Jesus Christ alongside of you. That is the secret to living a fulfilled, successful life. Have your millions of dollars and you can go straight to hell. You will be miserable on this earth. Have Jesus, know Jesus, You will be the happiest person on this planet. So in the end, does God want you to be happy? Yes, but only in him because he is the definition of happiness. He is the definition of beauty and perfection and majesty. And when you see that beautiful sunset or that beautiful sunrise, immediately go to worship. And there you will find your heart's desire. It is to know Christ. It is to make him known. And so our last worship song is not necessarily to be sung, but is to be sung in our hearts and to listen to the words and to pray in your heart and saying, Lord, may this song be the prayer of my heart. Because once that prayer is taken care of, All other prayers will rightly follow. And afterwards, I'll close in prayer. But it's time to dwell on this truth and ask yourself, Lord, show me where my heart is this morning.